Okay, let's look at Epicurus' letter to Herodotus using this Hackett edition. And this is uh, Epicurus overviewing the major points of his metaphysics, that is his theory about what, uh, what exists, what is real, what is, what is the universe made of. The first point, he says, is that nothing comes into being from what is not. Skipping a bit further, the totality, and our tra translators add, of things, the totality of things, has always been just like it is now, and always will be, for there's nothing for it to change into. Uh, nothing comes into being from what is not, and the, the total of what is, uh, is always what it is, because nothing comes to be from what is not. Um, everything that is includes everything that is. There's nothing outside of it uh, from which more could come or into which some of it could go. Uh, there's nothing for it to change into other than simply what it is. What is is what is. The totality, he says, is made up of bodies and void. Among bodies, some are compounds and some are those things from which compounds have been made. And these are atomic and unchangeable. Etc., etc. The totality is unlimited. For what is limited has an extreme, but an extreme is seen in contrast to something else, so that since it has no extreme, it has no limit, but since it has no limit, it would be unlimited and not limited. So the sum total of what exists is what it is, and uh, nothing comes to be from what is not, and uh, what is now always has been and always will be. There's nothing other than what is for it to change into or or, or go into or uh, have new things come in from. And uh, what exists is bodies and void. Bodies, uh, does that mean, uh, in the medical sense, bodies? No, it just means chunks of matter. It means physical things. And bodies are compounds or atoms. Atoms are the things compounds are made of. And the whole of what exists, the totality, is unlimited because it has no extreme. If it has no extreme, it has no limit. Why does it have no extreme? Because there's nothing else. The totality of what is cannot be compared to anything else because there is nothing else than what is, and therefore uh, there is no extreme and accordingly no limit. Uh, therefore, the totality of what is is unlimited. The totality is unlimited in respect of the number of bodies and the magnitude of the void. So what reality is, is uh, an infinite void and an infinite number of bodies in it, which are compounds and the atoms they're made of, etc., etc. I'm I'm skipping uh, actually rather a lot. I'm just going over mainly the topic sentences of the individual paragraphs as the text is arranged in in this edition. In addition, the bodies which are atomic and full, from which compounds both come to be and into which they are dissolved, are ungraspable when it comes to the differences among their shapes. And for each type of shape, there is quite simply an unlimited number of similar atoms, but with respect to the differences, they are not quite simply unlimited, but only ungraspable. So the atoms have different shapes. There's an infinite number of atoms uh, for each kind of atomic shape. And the atoms move continuously for all time, some recoiling far apart from one another upon collision, and others, by contrast, maintaining a constant vibration when they are locked into a compound or enclosed by the surrounding atoms of a compound, etc., etc. The atoms in the void are eternal. Now here's an important remark. If all these points are remembered, a maxim as brief as this will provide an adequate outline for developing our conceptions about the nature of what exists. Um, Epicurus is, is really big on uh, remembering fundamental principles and um, keeping them in mind when we're approaching any other question. Uh, so, uh, if all these points are remembered, a maxim as brief as this, like the atoms of the void are eternal, uh, will provide an adequate outline uh, for developing our conceptions about the nature of what exists. So, uh, a good brief summary statement is a good outline for everything else we have to think. Uh, hold on to the fundamentals, uh, employ them to, to think through everything else. One final point on this section of the text, uh, from this section of the text. Moreover, there is an unlimited number of cosmoi, and some are similar to this one and some are dissimilar. For the atoms, which are unlimited, as was shown just now, are also carried away to very remote distances, etc., etc. There's an infinite amount of space and an infinite number of atoms, and uh, the atoms have uh, similar shapes. 
So in an infinite amount of space with an infinite number of similar atoms, of course, similar arrangements, and no doubt I would imagine a number of identical arrangements, uh, will come into being somewhere. There are other worlds within the same, uh, the same infinite space. Okay, so um, cosmoi. The word cosmoi here is used. There's an unlimited number of cosmoi. You might want to say cosmoses uh, as plural of cosmos. Uh, cosmoi is a more proper um, uh, way of, of making uh, the word cosmos plural, uh, if we're sticking closer to the Greek. Okay, uh, now the text is arranged into these different sections, and we've just gone over some sections, uh, some bits of sections oh, 38 through 45. Now there's an account of sense perception from sections 46 to 53 of the text, and in this edition that goes from pages uh, 8 through uh, pages 8 through 10. I don't know that I'm going to say much about this section. Yeah, I'm going to skip the whole section on philosophy of perception. Let's go to section uh, 54 of the text, page 10 in this edition. Further, one must believe that the atoms bring with them none of the qualities of things which appear except shape, weight, and size, and the properties which necessarily accompany shape. For every quality changes, while the atoms do not change in any respect. So the the individual atoms are unchangeable uh, within themselves. Their relations to other atoms can change. Their position can change. All that is is atoms in motion in a void, and so you know, the atoms do change their location, but uh, they they don't change in any respect other than that. That is to say, their internal qualities are always the same. Only their position with respect to uh, one another changes. And what are the qualities of atoms? Uh, shape, weight, and size. Uh, etc., etc. That is why it is necessary that the things which are rearranged should be indestructible and not have the nature of what changes, but rather their own masses and configurations. For it is also necessary that these things should remain unchanged. Atoms do not change. Atoms are indestructible. For even with things in our experience which change their shapes by the removal of matter, the shape is grasped as inhering in the object which changes while its qualities do not so inhere. The shape remains, but the qualities are eliminated from the entire body. Uh, etc. etc. Let, let's let's uh, let's move along past this a bit. Let's get to this. This is this is interesting. Um, uh, at the time in which this video is aired on uh, YouTube, probably the Leibniz series will have long since already aired. Okay, so. Um, there's a lot of interesting comparisons and contrasts you could make uh, between Leibniz uh, and Epicurus. They're, they're both interested in atoms. Uh, Leibniz is giving a non-materialist philosophy of atomism. Epicurus is giving a materialist philosophy of atomism. Here's something they agree on, besides the existence of atoms. In addition to these points, one must not believe that there can be an unlimited number of masses, no matter how small, in any finite body. Consequent, not, consequently, not only must one eliminate unlimited division into smaller pieces, uh, but one must also not believe that within finite bodies there's an unlimited movement, not even by smaller and smaller stages. Let me rephrase something. This is another one where they disagree. Leibniz says space is inherently divisible, agreeing with people like Descartes on this subject. Uh, if you have some object of any size, it is, at least in principle, cuttable. You could cut it in two, and you could cut those parts in two, and you could keep going. As long as the objects have any size at all, they are divisible, according to Leibniz. Epicurus says... Otherwise, the atoms are indivisible. That's why they're atoms. Uh, in addition to these points, one must not believe that there can be an unlimited number of masses, etc. Consequently, not only must one eliminate unlimited division into smaller pieces, there cannot be an unlimited number of parts in, for example, my body or this book. Um, whiteboard marker. There's not an unlimited number of parts in the whiteboard marker, says Epicurus. Accordingly, the parts must be indivisible. The smallest parts, that is, must be indivisible. Leibniz would say otherwise. Leibniz would say <laughs> it's an unlimited number of parts. All the parts that have any size at all are divisible. Okay, so there's one distinction between one atomist and another atomist. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's skip sections 50... 57 or so through maybe 60, uh, but let's let's keep going in this text. 
And uh, mm, there's so much in the text, actually, that we should probably not wrap it up in this one video, maybe next time. But let's do a few more brief observations on the letter to Herodotus before we pause, uh, for the uh, before we stop for this particular video. Section 61, page 12 in this edition. Furthermore, it is necessary that the atoms move at equal speed when they move through the void and nothing resists them. For heavy things will not move faster than small and light ones, when, that is, nothing stands in their way. Nor do small things move faster than large ones, since they all have a passage commensurate to them, when, that is, nothing resists these atoms either. Nor is upward movement faster, neither is the sideways movement produced by collisions faster, nor is the downward movement caused by their own weight faster either. For as long as either of them prevails, the motion will continue as fast as thought until it meets with resistance either from an external source or from its own weight, counteracting the force of a colliding body. There is uh, some interesting um, uh, ancient precursor here. There are interesting ancient precursors here to ideas in modern physics, like inertia. But let's keep going. Moreover, with respect to compounds, some will move faster than others because though the atoms by themselves move at equal speed, because the atoms in aggregate are moving towards one place, i.e. in the same direction, in the shortest continuous time, etc., they frequently collide until the continuity of the motion becomes perceptible. For the added opinion concerning the invisible, i.e. that the unit's time which reason can contemplate will allow for continuous motion is not true in such cases, for everything that is observed or grasped by the intellect in an active application is true, etc., etc. So what, uh, what lesson do we draw from this last bit before we wrap up this video and save the uh, analysis of the soul for the next video. Uh, what observations do we make on this? I think only, only these brief observations. Epicurus is telling us that all that is is atoms in a void and that they have certain properties like shape and that they are in motion and that their motion continues always at the same speed. One atom moves at the same speed as another atom uh, unless obstructed. And that's pretty much it. This is a picture of the universe as made of atoms in a void, atoms in motion in a void, and that's it. That's all there is to reality. And the rest is just filling in uh, the details and understanding how uh, how these atoms in motion in a void um, produce life as we know it, and what sort of life we should live accordingly. And this, this ethical lesson of the metaphysics is going to be the real point, and we will get to it in subsequent videos. Thanks for watching. Epicurus is awesome. Uh, read the book, read the book. Don't let me do all your reading for you.